Hello, everybody. You still alive? Still awake? Yeah? Um, any of you forgot these eyeglasses? Any of you need these eyeglasses? Oh, come on. We're just trying to be helpful here. Um, so a few things before we introduce our last speaker. All of these presentations will be posted. You will get an email with links to the recordings. And I've heard and I know even for myself, I wasn't able to attend all of the concurrent sessions and I feel so bad about it because they are all excellent. Excellent. So you have a great opportunity to listen to the ones you missed or listen again the ones that you really liked. And then you have access to the presentations, to the PowerPoints, the slides. So I hope you learned a lot today. And without continuing any further, um, I just want to say that our closing speaker is an amazing, amazing person. You will love him. He is full of energy, very intelligent. And this wonderful person is Brian Norris. So he is an experienced healthcare clinician, a Google Glass explorer, executive, and innovator. He is CIO of Perseo, I got it right, in Indianapolis. I was trying to ask Brian what Perseo means, and I said, is it that you are a personal CIO? He said, no, it's not that. So he will tell us what Perseo means. But his work focuses on pushing the boundaries of health uh, into new spaces and identifying technologies that have great potential to make paradigm shifts in healthcare over the next 10 years. His presentation will explore the use of emerging technologies in health and the disruption they are causing today and they will still cause in the future. Thank you so much. Please welcome Brian Norris. send you the check for the nice intro. So good afternoon. I get the distinguished honor of being between you and going home or happy hour, one of the two. Uh, my name is Brian Norris, and as she mentioned earlier, my history, I've been a nurse for about 16 years now. I, I jumped into informatics. I know. I, I don't look it. Thank you. I jumped into informatics about 10 years ago uh, simply because a CNO friend of mine came to me and said, hey, the ICUs are chiseling vital signs into tablets in stone. You're pretty geeky. Why don't you get them up to snuff? I was an ICU nurse at the time. I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea what informatics was. I had no idea what data was. Fast forward to today, I've served uh, uh, with various different consulting firms. And uh, before I jumped into this entrepreneurial journey three years ago, I was the chief nursing informatics officer for a regional health system in Kentucky. And what I learned in that time is that within informatics, we can really start to push the boundaries. So a lot of what you've heard today and sort of leading up to this presentation has been a discussion of what do we do with data? What do we do with our EHRs? What I'm going to focus today on is pushing you outside those boundaries and starting to think about some of the next things that are coming and some of the things that we as informaticists that I firmly believe can start to impact. So, we mentioned Perseo, just real quick. I'm the CIO at Perseo. We're a big data analytics company out of Indianapolis. We're fairly new. We haven't celebrated our first birthday yet, but we're doing pretty well. We're growing rapidly. We spend about 40% of our businesses in healthcare. The rest of it fits in manufacturing and retail. And we're really pushing the boundaries of big data in terms of both data that sits within your systems and also the Internet of Things. So I brought a few toys. I brought a few things to show you today. But I brought them with a purpose, and we'll talk about them in terms of what they might actually mean, including my little drone friend here if he decides to fly. Now, I will say this. I'm only allowed to let it take off and land. I cannot fly it out over the crowd. The risk folks won't let me. So my goals for today, really, are to get you outside of the box. I want to explore some use cases. We're going to talk about things like genomics. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence. We're going to talk about machine learning. We're going to talk about some of these terms in context of what they might mean and how they might affect workflow. For those of you that don't know what that is, I will do my best to explain it. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask. 
And then I want to talk about it in the context of what it means for you. And if, and if I do my job right today, I will have planted a seed that you'll start to go back and start to research some of these items and think about how you can apply them both in your practice in school and as you grow into informatics roles within your health systems, yourselves within uh, potentially within uh, software manufacturers, or even folks like Intel and others that are, that are creating the Internet of Things. I like to start my healthcare speeches out with a Dr. Seuss quote. I love Dr. Seuss. I have little kids at home. Maybe I've been brainwashed, one of the two. But, you know, Dr. Seuss has a great quote. And he focused on things that are simple. So sometimes the questions are very complicated and, and the answers are simple. But a lot of times what we do in healthcare, and my best example of this was sitting in a meeting in multiple different health systems arguing over the color of urine that should go into our EHR. Or is it orange, is it blue, is it fuchsia, is it periwinkle? I don't know. It's urine, okay? It's, it's, it's a color. There's about five of them that we should use. Get over it. Which leads me to what we like to do in healthcare. We like to make the answers extremely complicated to very simple questions. And so what I'll, what I'll, what I'll put a challenge to you today is to step away from this and step up to Dr. Seuss for today. And think about the very complicated problems that we can start to solve with very, very, very low tech and very easy solutions. But before I go there, I want to talk about some of the things that are driving today's innovation need. So we've heard about many of these today. Starting over to my right, everyone who in here tweets or uses Facebook or gets on there, how many of you have used it for a health purpose? To either ask a question or look for an answer to a healthcare problem? A few? It's rising. I built a social media analytics tool that some folks at HHS utilize to monitor for disease and disaster surveillance. And they monitor for over 200 different diseases. And you would be shocked by the amount of volume of information that people start to seek to social media around disease, particularly most recently Ebola. Ebola went from very few tweets about the disease to over 300,000 per hour at the height of Ebola as it was hitting the United States shores within the nurses. People freak out. They go on social media. They ask questions. But beyond that, we're starting to see a lot of studies of consumers using social media to drive education, to be part of a group, to be part of a consumer group. Consumers want to know what health care costs. We all know what the cost of a price of a gallon of milk is. We all know that gas just went from three bucks to two bucks a gallon, and we all celebrated that that dropped a dollar. But we have no idea what health care costs. I'll talk about that in context of this band that's on my arm. You've heard about it from Aaron earlier for those that attended a session or, or went out to their booth. This band is a low-cost $200 EMG sensor. If I were to go into my doctor today, to get an upper extremity EMG scan, not only would they stick needles in my muscles, which are very painful, but they would charge me about $500 for that exam. The device itself costs over $10,000. So how can technology start to change the way in which we use this? And I'll show you the high velocity data coming from my arm in a second. Hospitals are moving towards meaningful use. How many of you have heard of meaningful use? You heard it pretty much all day. How are we using technology to go get piles of, of money? Well, guess what? The money's running out, and now we've got to really use these things. And so this is driving the need for further innovation. And last but not least, 62% of consumers are interested in self-monitoring devices. How many of you have a Fitbit, any sort of wearable device that you monitor your steps, your weight, your food, your intake on? Raise your hands. Come on, there's way more than that, right? About maybe a quarter of the room. That's growing. It's growing at a rapid pace. And I'll show you a slide that not only are those devices growing, but things like the Nest thermostat in your home, devices to go on your refrigerator to see if, how many times grandma opened the fridge, sensors to go on your medications to make sure that consumers took their medications after they left their walls. My grandmother's a good example. She was a, a renal patient, a diabetic patient. I helped her set up her medications every day. Several years ago, I moved away for two years to go down to Texas to take a role, and that left a huge gap in her care. It left the person that helped her understand her medications and understand how she took them. And sometimes she was financially strapped, and what we found out was sometimes she'd split her pills. 
How many times have you cared for patients that have come in that are CHF patients that have gained weight because they split their pills because they were trying to save money, right? If we only knew that that was happening more real time, what could we prevent? We could prevent increased costs. We could prevent harm to those patients. And sensor technologies are going to start to help us do that. Don't take my word for it. The rise is here. Uh, these are all quotes from various different entities in terms of the actual dollars and cents of this. But if you think of between now and two years from now, 26, almost $27 billion spent on mobile health care. And that's just the start. You'll see how many more devices are coming online. And beyond that, using the data that comes from these is extremely important. So it's one thing to put a sensor in a home. It's another thing to make sure you can aggregate that information across the pool. That's what I'm doing today. And I'll, ex I'll show you some examples of what that might do. Beyond that, each one of these buttons is a monstrosity all upon itself. And they're a little bit all over the place. But we start with meaningful use. And we go all the way to telehealth. We talk. What's impacting healthcare today is cost. If you are following the news, just a couple days ago, CMS came out and said 30%, 30%. Keep in mind, healthcare organizations run on a 3 to 5% margin. 30% of their CMS reimbursements are going to be tied to value and not pay, not pay for click. That's a huge deal. And then a couple years, from, couple years later from that, 50% are going to be tied to value. So it means we need to find better ways. We need to find ways to cr collect data. We need to find ways to push data. We need to find ways to use that data to move the needle on all of these things, or else the system falls apart. I say informatics is at the heart of that. We help translate those technology needs to that process. We help make it simple. We help those complex problems become very, very simple. Beyond that. For those of you that are familiar with Gartner, if you're not familiar with Gartner, Gartner's kind of the, the source for all things technology and others. They're, they're very well known in terms of publications around what's going on within the market. This is what's called a hype cycle. Over to your right, you have very early on things that are like 10, 15 years out on an innovation trigger. As they start to get really, really exciting, things like big data today. We hear a lot about big data. We hear a lot about 3D printing. You're starting to see 3D printers everywhere. Eventually, you're going to be able to see them. You're going to see them at Best Buy and Walmart. And everyone's going to have a 3D printer in their home, just like you have a regular printer today. They go through a very inflation of expectations. Everyone gets really excited. Once that excitement wears off, it goes through this trough of disillusionment. We're starting to see things go through that. Stuff like cloud computing. We used to talk about the cloud. Now we're talking about you know, data lakes and where the cloud exists and new clouds and all kinds of virtual private clouds. There's lots of clouds. And it's starting to move through that. And as it starts to emerge, it gets more mainstream. Things that we utilize every single day sit well beyond this, like a refrigerator, et cetera. I'm going to touch on a few of these technologies as they're starting to emerge. But my argument and my plea to you is research some of this. Think about how beyond the EHR, beyond what you do today, you can make an impact in health. Bioprinting, artificial intelligence, machine learning, utilizing technologies like IBM Watson beyond beating Jeopardy. All of these things are at our fingertips as informaticists. And we can make a big impact using them. So big data. You've heard about data. You've heard about big data. Sorry, my wrist and my pocket are vibrating at the same time. That's big data, right? This is over in China, or the Philippines, one of the two. I love to use this. This is an example of what we see every single day in healthcare in terms of data. This could be medication lists. This could be allergies. This could be your intake forms as your patients come in. It lives everywhere, and it is a mess. Our job is to help make sense of that data. Our job is to take that messy data, take these new technologies, leverage these new technologies, and drive the needle forward. And as informaticists, I believe that we can do that. And we can help translate it and, and do it in a very simple way. So again, as I go back to my, my goal is just to plant the seed. Think about how you use data every day. Think about the data you collect. Think about why it's useful. Think about why it's not useful. And help think through the process. 
If you're in an informatics role today in your organization, go back and think about how you might start leveraging data analytics. And we're going to talk about some of the stages here in a second, because I wouldn't do justice as a big data company without spending a few moments on big data. But big data is also very complicated. This is a NASCAR slide of many organizations that are playing in this field. And as you see different buckets here, you see we've got data analytics platforms. We've got tons of databases coming out that are SQL, non-SQL, XSQL, I mean, whatever the next name is, they're going to come out. Data mining tools, business intelligence tools. We've got new tools coming out from IBM like Watson and being able to do sentiment analysis on demand, being able to start building machine learning and predictive algorithms on demand. We've got uh, all kinds of uh, graphing tools. There's a bazillion of them out there. So the landscape's extremely complex. And I, I would also say it's our job to help take this complexity and make it simple for our organizations. So as you think about those data problems, also think about the tools you have at your fingertips. And it doesn't have to be a $3,000 analytics tool or a super expensive solution to really move the needle. We, many of you have Microsoft Office on your laptops today or some form thereof or Google spreadsheets. And in those spreadsheets, you can start to do data analytics and move the needle. So think about how that fits in. As you write your papers in schools, think about how data fits in. Think about that diabetic patient. Think about the actions that it might take to bend the curve. Do they take it at day? Do they take it at night? What's going on? Beyond that, there are three stages. And most of us in this room are in a very descriptive stage of analytics. What I mean by descriptive is we throw up a chart. Maybe we throw up a couple charts. We have a dashboard. We look at that dashboard every day. But it doesn't translate anything. It doesn't mean anything unless you physically translate it. It doesn't help move the needle. As we move up this ladder, we move more to a predictive stage. And this is what I spend a lot of time thinking about and doing. And in a predictive stage, we're taking what's happened in the past as patterns, training systems, and looking to what potentially may happen in the future, and then driving that back into the business. So I'll give you an example. We can use predictive models based on patients' behaviors and personas to identify the percentage of time that they might actually comply with their medication schedule. What does that mean? It means if I'm discharging a patient and I have an indicator that says, or I'm seeing that patient in my office, and, that, and I have an indicator that says Brian is more likely to not take his meds because of all these variables, and here are the variables that we think are causing him to be more unlikely to take them, I can tailor that care and I can address it in different ways. That's predictive analytics. Adaptive is where a lot of organizations aren't today. Many are not. And it will be some time before they get there. And what adaptive is, is it's taking these predictive algorithms on high and embedding it into the DNA of the organization, embedding it into everything you do. So as you start to care for patients and it starts predicting and giving you those scores, you're not even having to think about it. It's built into your workflow. It's driving the organization. And they're auto-adapting themselves. So they're realizing that, oh, hey, I've weaned off a little bit. This algorithm is no good anymore, and it's self-correcting. Or it alerts somebody to correct it. Adaptive is where I believe we will be in the next 10 years in healthcare, And it's all of us that will help get it there. As we think about those processes, we move beyond the EHR. We move beyond the arguments of the color of urine. And we move more into what we really do, which is drive patient care, care for patients every day make sure they're not sick, make sure they're well, and use data in a way that really helps them. But, we've, but now we've got this explosion of things. So that's data we have. Data we're going to collect over the next 10 years. This is a chart of the last, uh, since what, 1990, 80, 90. It's hard for me to say. 1990. A million things, right? We've got computers. That's about it. If by 20, so what, five years from now, we're going to have over 50 billion connected things. And those things are Fitbits, and we've all got mobile phones, and our fridges are going to have sensors, and our cars have sensors. There's a huge push around telematics in the automotive industry. 
How many of you have OnStar? That's connected to the internet. I just read Terms of Service on Acario, and the other day apparently it's connected somehow via cellular single. So all of these things are going to start talking to each other. But who cares, right? So I don't, I don't really care. But what happens when I can start to get data from the cloud about a patient, about their dietary habits? Did they take their medicine? Are they ambulatory? Can I leverage predictive analytics to say, hey, he normally gets up and goes to the bathroom five times a day. I've only seen him gone once. What's going on? Maybe I'm a CHF patient and I have an issue. That's where we can start to really move the needle. But the challenge is these things are coming online way faster than we can even deal with it, than we can even think about them. Every single day a new vendor is coming out with some sort of sensor or some sort of technology. If you don't believe me, go out and Google CES, look at the CES show, and this year they had a ton of medical devices, way more than they've ever had. Intel came out with a little chip called Curie that is supposed to let anybody turn anything into an internet of thing or a connected thing. So you guys are coming into informatics for the students that are coming in, and for those of you that have been into informatics for a while, you're, we're at a great time. But we're at a time that I would challenge we got to step outside the EHR, step, a, step, continue to be involved, but step beyond just helping configure systems or define what's on the next flow sheet or help respond to the next joint commission regulation by putting up another sheet or another form in our EHR. We need to move the needle on clinical decision support. And to do that, we're going to have to think through some of these new models. So I wear the sensor on my arm. I'm going to escape out of this presentation for a moment. You all can see my Outlook invite. And I'm going to show you what I mean by high velocity sensor data. So I've been wearing this since the start of this presentation. I've collected over 600,000 rows of data from my arm. Over to the right is measuring the acceleration. So if I go like that, you see that line spike in the middle. It went faster. Up, up above, here, let me make this a little smaller so you can see them all. There we go. Down here is the orientation. And then there's a gyroscope that sort of tells me the pitch. And y'all, over here are, each one of these pods is reading the electrical signal coming from my hand up my arm. Now what we can do, is we can program software to do things responding to this. But also, as I mentioned earlier, we could do things like make the drone take off, fly the drone around, which I'm not allowed to do, and make the drone land. But we can also control things. So I met with somebody the other day, and they mentioned ALS. So we have diseases like ALS, we have diseases like Parkinson's that debilitate people. We have folks that can't use their arms, so therefore, how do they use a computer? How, how are they connected to the world? Things like Google Glass came out, and I got really excited like Aaron did about Glass. I got super excited. I thought, oh my God, this is going to change the world for a lot of people, and I still think perceptual computing will. It's just not in that footprint because it's too geeky looking. But when we get past that, perceptual computing will change the world. Because simply, I can give people now the ability to connect. That a patient that can't use their hands but can use their feet, why couldn't I give them the ability to use the internet? That patient coming in that needs that carpal tunnel EEG, why should I have to stab a needle in their arm? Why couldn't I do that test at home? And why couldn't I get that data all the time? What happens when I get the million rows of data plus every hour? When can I start to collect this information to look for patterns of me at home? And as sensor technology becomes more embedded into our clothing, which it already is starting to be, just check your Nike shoes next time you, have a, you go for a run, we're going to know about patterns in mobility. We've never been able to see this as clinicians. We've always wanted to. We build these really beautiful care plans, send them home, and then they come back in less than 30 days later because they never followed them. Or they forgot half of what we told them on the way out the door as we gave them the flyby for education. We now have the ability to see how they're doing. And it's unprecedented. But to, to really help our organizations, to really help patients take advantage of these technologies, we have to understand them. We have to test. We have to be willing to fail. 
I've felt a lot. I've learned a lot from it. I've had a lot of great ideas that turned out to be really bad. But I've had some good ones that turned out to help people too. And I would implore you to not be afraid to fail, to not be afraid to push the envelope and test new things and bring them out in your organizations. And even if they go kicking and screaming into the night to say, hey, you know, we don't want to go there. All we want to do are these forms. Explore it outside. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to have to move towards this. Who knows about genomics? A couple people in the room. So genomics, who's, who's studied uh, DNA or has heard of DNA? Right. OK, so if, a few haven't. Why did it go to the drone? That is not DNA. These little A's and T's and C's and G's all on here are code. Think of it as computer code that make up every single one of us. We are all very similar to each other with the exception of about a percent or two. That changes. There are a few things, but there's a huge amount of money and research being pumped into healthcare right now to understand this code, to understand the anomalies in this code, particularly with cancer and cancer research. Over the last decade, there have been projects like the Human Genome Project to map our entire genome in terms of code. And now what researchers are doing or they're studying those genomes to look for the anomalies to target treatment based on gene therapy. Now, that is a huge deal because that means I can get personalized care. That means they can target things which we were never once able to cure. And possibly, we could eradicate disease based on knowing what those, what those diseases are doing within our genome. But we, have one, we had one problem. Over to my right is 2001. Over to my left, if I can remember right versus left, is 2013. In 2001, to run a full genome sequence on me to understand everything I am, the data alone is more than a terabyte. It would have cost $100 million. Now I can tell you nobody will spend $100 million to run a genome sequence on me. So if I got sick in 2001, I'm totally host. But today it's less than 10000 and there is a race to get this less than $1,000 per genome sequence. If you think about what this means to the data you're going to have available to you as clinicians, it is huge. It means that as this cost curve has started to bend significantly in 2007, we are going to start to see clinical decision support not only targeted based on protocols and things that we've written out, but targeted based on your genome and things that we know about you. It means that we're going to be able to say, this particular drug has a 96.3% likelihood of affecting uh, your treatment versus this particular drug that may have a 60% simply because of your genome. It's a big deal. And it means that we have to understand this so that we can help build efficient clinical decision support. Because the dark side of all this, and as we start to bring it into clinical decision support, is that we have too much of it is that we start to get alert fatigue and we start getting a lot of information just shoved at us. But simply by bringing down the cost of the technology that's used to run the sequence means we are going to have better data. And we as informaticists have to push the envelope on this. There are already organizations that are. I'll talk briefly about the drones. So we've heard about drone technologies. Uh, there's a lot of debate that's going on right now at the FAA and the federal level to talk about commercial drones, if you've heard about that. I look forward to the day that the good old boys in Indiana start shooting down drones. That, that'll be good to see on CNN. But think about what this means. There's been some studies that have looked at the time to get an EMS to you versus the time to get a defibrillator in the event of a cardiac event. And if a drone were close by, in some cases, the drone could be faster. As we try to deliver medical supplies, we can make these things go autonomous and send routes. In the case of Hurricane Katrina or a public health disaster, we had helicopters flying all over the place trying to find people on rooftops and save them. And sometimes it took days. With drone technology, we can send drones out, map an area, get the data, and find out what we need to find. We can send these things out and we can have live video feeds of the scene. Think about the way we do EMS reports today. We phone up and say, oh, by the way, Brian was in this horrendous car accident, which I hope I'm not, in the next three and a half hours. And he was pinned in this way. And we describe it. What if we could show it? What if we could send it out, throw the drone up, and show it? So 
as we start to think about drone technology, it's not just about Amazon trying to deliver a TV quicker. It's about us being able to deliver medical supplies. It's about us being able to get that defibrillator there quicker. It's also about us using the technology in a way that helps us from a public health and a surveillance standpoint. Augmented reality. This is my, one, of my, one of my kids. I hope she, she's a little bigger than that now. But that was when Google Glass first came out. But if we think about glass and we think about what other technologies are bringing us. They're really going to bring us augmented reality. So the ability down the line, not only to see the pills for what they are and the data that, the, that is there, but being able to look at our patients and get augmented clinical decision support. Being able to be out in the wild and see something that's happening and an EMS provider gets an alert and gets information. And from a military standpoint, they're starting to use augmented reality today. We're starting to see things in the gaming industries, such as the $2 billion acquisition of Oculus Rift. For those of you familiar with Oculus Rift, Oculus is a 3D virtual reality world headset that looks really geeky, but somehow has gotten $2 billion. They trumped Google. But it's really exciting in the gaming world. And why did they get excited about it? Because it's a social world that we can start to interact with. And as we give education, what do we do? We hand you a piece of paper. We give you a two-dimensional view. We don't include you, and we don't show you. We don't give you the ability to show us nine times out of 10. And if we do, it's on the way out the door. What if we could give that ability anytime? What if we could push the envelope and use those technologies in different ways? What if we could look at data in different ways? Beyond augmented reality, we have 3D technologies. As we talk about data, and as we talk about big data, as we talk about visualizing data, many of our organizations today look at data in two dimensions. So what I'm showing you here is the home health data, the STARS data that's reported every day about quality and staffing hours and health inspection scores. If I were to show this to you in a 2D world, I'd have about six graphs. The ones up here at the top If I turn this way, these up here are the groups that I want to go to. They've got great staffing. They've got great quality measures. They've, got, they've done well on health inspections. These guys, as I fly through, sometimes I just want Star Wars music to go with this. You can picture it. Dun, 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 dun. So I'm not... I've made it so I can't click on these, simply because I want to protect the innocent. I don't want to call anybody out. But if we were to click on each one of those spheres, we now can see the cluster of information about who might need some improvement. What if we use this type of technique every day? I just showed you six charts that we would have spent, I don't know how long, debating in the boardroom about never be able to connect the three dimensions together in about 20 seconds. So I think beyond the virtual reality, the 3D technologies are going to start to help us understand data in a whole lot of new ways. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. One moment, please. How many of you have ever used a 3D printer? I have. They're cool. You should get one. So 3D printers, much like Genomes were super expensive. Now they've come down in price. What I've shown you here is actually a cut out of a recent news clipping about a man who, 3D, who took his wife's radiology images, brought them home, 3D printed her skull to show her tumor better, to drive better treatment. Now there's a long story behind this, as I won't go into it. But the point is, is that 3D printing in medical technologies and medical procedures is here. Beyond 3D printing items to be able to look at tumors and look at things in a new way, we're seeing bioprinting. We're seeing the ability early on to print body parts. I know, it sounds really creepy. But if you think of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are on lists waiting for organs that die every day that drive cost of care up, simply being able to take a cell and print a new organ is huge. It changes the model fundamentally. And it 
again, back to us as informaticists, I'm not saying go get a 3D printer and print a liver at home, although that would be cool. Think about what this means to your practice. Think about what this means to your patient. As a nurse, I took care of cardiac transplant patients. I took care of patients that waited for years for hearts. If we had the ability to 3D print that heart to that specific patient without them having to take a whole bunch of anti-rejection meds, their outcome and their lives would have changed significantly. This isn't sci-fi, this isn't Star Wars. We're starting to do this stuff today. And it's gonna to continue to evolve. Now the 3D printing of a heart or a liver or other body parts is years and years off, but it's coming and there are researchers working on it right now. As informaticists, it's up to us to keep up to date on this technology and think about how we might be able to push those boundaries. Artificial intelligence and robotics. How many of you have heard of artificial intelligence and robots? You've all seen the Terminator. We're all going to turn into it pretty soon. These little robots over here I love. I love these robots. So the rise of mental health. If we think of the problem we're trying to solve, mental health is on a significant rise in this country. It is costing us trillions of dollars. And it is one of the areas we have yet to truly fund well in innovation. And if we think of why, right? So if we step back beyond the why and we start to think about the population itself, the average age of an American continues to rise and will do so over the next two to three decades, simply as the baby boomers move through. And if we think of the advent of dementia, Alzheimer's, the way we want to care for our loved ones, and what can really help move the needle, sometimes it's companionship, sometimes it's recognizing patterns. These little fun robots over here that are being used in the UK are helping remind patients to take meds. They're looking at patterns of activity and voice patterns, and they're reporting data back in a predictive way back to caregivers, and they're actually having a lot of positive outcomes. We're gonna start to see more of these robotic types of solutions helping us get data, helping us move the needle on that care. Beyond that, over here I have a little picture of IBM's Watson playing Jeopardy. If you notice, Watson won $77,000. I think a few zeros went on to that to create him. So probably not a good investment. But IBM, what IBM has done is they've moved Watson out of research. And what Watson is, is Watson is a supercomputer. Watson can learn everything we've learned in, our, in 100 lifetimes in a minute. It, it is an amazing, amazing, amazing computer, right? And we can tap it. We can leverage it, we can use it, and we can augment us with it. And what IBM has done is they've moved Watson out of research and into commercialization. And what that means is that we're starting to see applications built on top of its technology. We're starting to see organizations leverage sentiment analysis and Watson APIs to move the needle to process tons of text. For example, cancer. Much of our data on cancer lives in unstructured textual documents and progress notes over the last several decades. The treatments, the type, the size, the location, all of that information. Technology like Watson is helping us unlock that information. It's helping us understand it and it's helping us do analytics on it. I'm almost done, I promise. This is the last one. Telematics, this is my car. I faked this one, by the way, just full disclosure. So up there is my Fitbit data. But what we're starting to see is auto manufacturers start to put data on your, on your windshield. If you happen to drive a Tesla, they have a really, which obviously I do not, they have a very, very cool giant iPad-like thing that gives you tons of information. But if you think about what telematics is gonna start to bring to us, telematics is gonna start to look at your vital information. It's gonna start to converge it within your car. A connected car world can change a lot of things. We're seeing the Google car, the automated car that drives for you. I believe before the end of my lifetime, that'll be the norm. I could be wrong. I'll be dead, so it won't matter. <laughs> but, I believe, but I believe that that's what's going to happen. We're going to have convergence of our driving patterns, and we're going to start to recognize potentially early signs of Alzheimer's. How many of you have seen somebody in their car driving around that you're like, that person probably shouldn't have a driver's license because they're going 20 miles an hour in the 85 lane and so on and so forth. 
we're going to start to see this convergence in the telematic space. We're going to start to see our, our information converge with new displays. Why not? The windshield's there. Why shouldn't we use it? So with that, I've explored a few technologies. There's plenty more we can explore, but I'll stop and I'll open it for questions. And I appreciate your time, and I want to thank you guys for, for an hour of your time. We have time for questions. Anybody have a question? Raise your hand high. Anybody? They all want to go to happy hour. <laughs> I'm up for it. <laughs> I got three and a half hour drive. <laughs> yes. Hi there. Uh, I guess I'm trying to start thinking about the future already. And one of the things I've heard about recently is the technology you can use at home to like diagnose an ear infection. Mm -hmm. So I think it's profoundly going to change our world as nurses and the doctor's world. Can you talk a little bit about how you think in the next 10 years doctors' lives may change in terms of? Yeah. So. Um, we're starting to see it now, so I'll talk about it in context of today. So you, you've seen in-home genomics testing, in-home drug testing, in-home uh, strips that we can use to test various different things and start getting that to our provider. So I think, you know, as you think about the aspect of how we deliver care today, it's extremely bricks and mortar. But we're hearing all the concepts of telehealth and we're moving the traditional care models outside those walls. And us as consumers, as we have more connected devices, I, I at home have a thermometer that connects to my smartphone that sends every time, you know, one of my kids is sick or I'm sick, sends that information to the cloud. And then I can look at my kid's school and see, it, and see if anybody else has been sick on aggregate. I think that that's really going to move the needle for providers. It's going to be very rudimentary early on. It's going to be things like temperatures. It's going to be things like our weights that we see today. It's going to emerge to in-home diagnostics for things that we typically go to the doctor for. You know, hemoglobin A1Cs eventually will be at home, I believe. They're not yet, but I'm sure that they will be over time. Um, ultimately, we're going, to, we're going to find those niches. We're going to move them forward. I think the big challenge for physicians is going to be not having to order that test, not having to have that conversation. And what happens when that test comes back abnormal. What do we do today? Well, we wait to tell you until you come into the office so we can try to explain it to you the best we can. Hopefully that's what happens. Sometimes it doesn't. But what happens when that's abnormal and a patient goes, well, what does this mean? I don't understand. I'm freaking out. That's why some of the genomics testing companies got into a little bit of trouble earlier with the FDA. So I think over time we're going to start to see physicians model change in terms of which they're used to bringing them into brick and mortar, and they're going to have to embrace these new tests. There's a huge rub right now against the financial model for that, though. So telehealth just got approved at a very rudimentary level. I think it's like $49 if you live in a rural health area. Eventually, that will change, and telehealth visits will be here forever. I think, I think this new generation coming up is not going to want to go to the doctor. They're not going to want to wait three hours to go see a doctor. They just literally want to tap their iPhone, send them a test, and be done with it. Um, how much do you think the internet infrastructure is going to be holding back some of these new innovations? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, if you follow broadband legislation, it's a very interesting thing. So you've seen you know, Google come out with high-velocity fiber to increase the pipe, if you will, in certain cities. But there's a large debate around, are those cities ready for that pipe? There's also a large debate around, um, without going into a ton of boring detail for everyone here, where that pipe lives, the conduit and the things we feed that pipe through in terms of fiber. I, th I, I think we're going to adapt. I think there are going to be just like, uh, if you've heard the term um, uh, within the food world, food deserts, I think there are going to be internet deserts, right? And so, you know, beyond the United States, if we think of third world countries, they're already trying to solve that. Um, you know, Google has its projects, others have theirs to bring internet connectivity into Africa, for example. But I think as we have more and more things, we're going to continually be fighting for bandwidth. I mean, my house, I have pretty high-speed internet, but I've got way too many things connected. You know, my, everything's connected to it. So I think it's going to be an interesting dimension. But it's moving faster. Uh, the infrastructure so far has moved a little bit faster than the things, but that's starting to change significantly.
Very nice presentation, Brian. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are you going to give me another check, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I worked in pharmaceutical industry and one of the biggest struggles were FDA approval and this was the pain in the neck for anybody in terms of money and time. So in terms of accepting all of these cool devices, mm -hmm. how do you see FDA playing a role in, in moving forward? Oh wow. Um, is this still recorded? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so you know, if you follow policy, which for some reason I like it, I, my sleeping pills apparently don't work. Um, the FDA has come out with a number of, re of regulations, uh, starting with about a little less than a year ago, a set of regulations around mobile apps and devices. So, you know, for example, that thermometer I mentioned that's connected to my mobile phone, it had to go through FDA approval to be able to be utilized and sort of guidance. Um, but they just recently put out some legislation that sort of clarified a lot of their stance which eased up a lot on, you know, if I want to build a mobile app, for example, that gives analytics on some device, as long as that device isn't connected, and as long as I'm not providing a recommendation to you that says you should go do X versus Y, I typically am safe. I'll disclaimer that with, if you're building a product, always ask a lawyer. They're good at spending your money and telling you things. Um, but, if I'm building a thermometer that's connected to my phone, or if I'm going to build the next otoscope that's connected to my phone, that then for some reason when I go to use that, it tells me something to go do about my ear, then I'm starting to tread into FDA water. So I, I think they're gonna play a huge role, and, and they're adapting. So if you think of how are they gonna go regulate the 50 billion thing market, and every one of those billions of things that comes on the market isn't We'd like to think every company is ethical, but not all of them are gonna to go to the FDA and say, hey, by the way, I just created this new widget. I'm gonna go spend another $2 million to go get approved and wait 20, you know, 12 months to come onto the market. We're gonna see them rush in the market. And so I think the FDA is also having to adapt right now into how, how are they gonna regulate this? How are they going to manage it? How are they gonna keep people safe? But also, how can they do that? Any other questions, comments? Well, thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian.